lesson we're going to be looking at a type of market failure known as positive externalities of consumption. We'll define this term, we'll look at several examples of positive externalities of consumption, we'll do a graphical analysis and talk briefly about some of the possible government solutions that can result in a more efficient allocation of resources than that achieved by the free market. Let's start with the definition of a positive externality of consumption. These market failures exist any time the consumption of a good or service creates spillover benefits enjoyed by a third party not involved in the market transaction. This is all a fancy way of saying that a good creates benefits for society, not just for the individual that is consuming it. This results in a market failure because the quantity produced by the free market of these goods will be less than the socially optimal quantity. Therefore, there is a role for government in these markets to increase the quantity produced and consumed of the good in order to achieve a more socially optimal outcome. Some classic examples of positive externalities of consumption include the following. Education, public transportation, health care, low-income housing, job training, and vaccines. There are many other examples of positive externalities of consumption, but these all share some things in common. For each of these, the consumption by individuals creates benefits for society as a whole. Let's look at one case study as an example. Let's look at the market for train and bus travel. We'll just assume that train and bus travel are being provided by the free market. Why does individuals traveling by train and bus create benefits for the rest of society that exceed those benefits enjoyed by the individuals themselves? Well, this is quite simple. When individuals travel by train or bus, there are fewer cars on the road, less air pollution, lower greenhouse gas emissions, and less demand for automobile fuel. All of these things benefit society as a whole. Therefore, we can say that the marginal social benefit of train and bus travel exceeds the marginal private benefit. Now this simple analysis will help us set up our graph here. Let's do a marginal benefit and marginal cost analysis of the market for train and bus travel. Rather than looking at the price of train and bus travel, we're going to be examining the marginal benefits and the marginal costs to individuals and to society of traveling by trains and buses. So on our graph we can draw the marginal benefit of train and bus travel to the individuals who choose to travel by train and bus. We call this the marginal private benefit. We can also graph the supply of train and bus travel that would be provided by the free market based on the private costs to firms of providing train and bus service. This represents the marginal private cost. The level of train and bus travel that will be provided by the free market is simply found by the intersection of marginal private cost and marginal private benefit. We call this quantity the equilibrium quantity of train and bus travel. The price that corresponds to this quantity is where marginal private benefit equals marginal private cost. This will be the free market equilibrium price of train and bus travel. So where's the market failure here? Let's consider the costs of train and bus travel. We are not looking at how the production of train and bus service provides spillover benefits or costs on society. So there is actually no externality in the provision of train and bus travel. So I can say that the marginal private cost equals the marginal social cost, which of course represents the supply of train and bus service that will be provided by the free market. The externality is not in the provision of train and bus travel, rather it is in the consumption of train and bus travel. When individuals choose to take the train or bus, there are fewer cars on the road, there is less air and noise pollution, there is less risk of traffic, accidents, and waste productivity and time from people sitting in traffic. So the society as a whole is going to benefit more than the individual travelers who are choosing to take buses or trains. The marginal social benefit curve lies beyond the marginal private benefit curve because for every trip traveled by train or bus, the private benefit, which is represented by our MPB curve, and we could say, for example, that QE 
trips by train or bus. The private benefit is found by going over to the horizontal axis from our MPB curve. However, the benefit to society as a whole is greater than the private benefit by the vertical distance between the MPB curve, the private benefit curve, and the MSB curve. So at the equilibrium quantity of trips taken by private individuals on trains and buses, there are spillover benefits. There are external benefits represented by the vertical distance between the marginal social benefit and the marginal private benefit curve. So this represents the size of the external benefit to society as a whole. And here we see the market failure. At the equilibrium quantity of train and bus travel, the benefit that society derives, represented by the marginal social benefit here on a vertical axis, is greater than the benefit to the individuals who are traveling by train and bus. Knowing that at the equilibrium quantity, society is benefiting more from train and bus travel than the individuals who are choosing to actually pay for it and take public transportation, we can see that there is a potential for an increase in total welfare represented by this triangle here, which would be the increase in societal welfare if more people traveled by train and bus. So this in some graphs would be called the welfare loss or the deadweight loss, but here we're going to actually call it the potential welfare gain. Potential welfare gain. In other words, if more people took trains and buses, we would have a greater quantity of train and bus travel undertaken by individuals in society and the socially optimal level could be realized which occurs where the marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost. As we have seen in previous lessons on market failure, a market is only considered allocatively efficient when output is achieved at the socially optimal level where marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost. So at this price, which we will call the socially optimal price, MSB equals MSC. Resources are essentially under allocated towards train and bus travel by the free market. Resources are under allocated towards train and bus travel. Here we have the graph for a positive externality of consumption. The social benefits, which include the external benefits of less traffic, less pollution, less chance of accidents, less CO2 emissions, these social benefits include not only the private benefits, but also the external benefits that society as a whole enjoys from people traveling by train or bus. In the graph, we can see that the marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal private benefit, Therefore, the free market equilibrium quantity is less than the socially optimal quantity. There is a potential welfare gain from more of the good being produced and consumed. The market has failed to achieve a socially optimal quantity of train and bus travel. What can be done to reduce the size of this potential welfare gain? What can government do to increase the number of people who take trains and buses and therefore reduce the number of people driving cars, which creates all sorts of negative externalities that society must bear? Government solutions to positive externalities of consumption take several forms. The most obvious solution that is probably popping into your head right now is subsidies. Subsidies reduce the marginal private cost of a good, thereby increasing its supply, leading to a lower price and an increased quantity demanded. We can show the effect of a subsidy in the market for public transportation in our graph and show how this can reduce the size of the potential welfare gain. A subsidy to the providers of train and bus travel will lower the marginal private costs. So I can shift my MPC curve down. This is the marginal private cost with a subsidy. A lower marginal private cost will lead to a decrease in the equilibrium price of train and bus travel to P1, which moves us along our marginal private benefit curve. We can see that as the supply of train and bus travel increases due to the government subsidy, the quantity demanded increases. So I can call this quantity QS for the quantity with a subsidy. At QS, I can go up to my marginal social cost curve and continue up to my marginal social benefit curve 
and I can see that the triangle representing the potential welfare gain is now much smaller. The new potential welfare gain is this blue triangle on the right. The subsidy for public transportation has not entirely eliminated the market failure. However, it has reduced the size of the welfare loss resulting from the underproduction of train and bus travel. So a subsidy is an obvious solution to a positive externality of consumption. There are other ways that government can incentivize the production and consumption of a good as well. Positive advertising could be one. Looking back at our list of examples, we can see that education, public transportation, health care, low-income housing, job training, government can promote these things among households and consumers. Stay in school campaigns are an example of a positive advertising campaign that is meant to incentivize people to remain in school, obviously, because education provides spillover benefits for society beyond those enjoyed by the person who is actually getting the education. So an example of a positive advertising campaign meant to increase the consumption of a good with positive externalities is a stay in school campaign. Any other campaigns the government can initiate in order to encourage public transportation. So ads encouraging the use of public transport. Positive advertising increases the marginal private benefit of a good, therefore increases the demand and reduces the gap between the equilibrium quantity and the socially optimal quantity. A third option for increasing the quantity of a good that creates positive externalities is government provision. Looking back at our list of examples, we can highlight some that government actually do provide in the rich world. Public transportation is not actually provided entirely by government. Usually people still have to buy tickets to take trains and buses. However, in some rich world countries, health care is provided. Education is provided up to a certain level. In many Northern European countries, even a university education is paid for by the government. Many countries, when workers become unemployed, workers can receive job training from the government. So job training is another good that would be underprovided by the free market, but thanks to government provision, it is available at a level that provides benefits for society as a whole. So government often provides goods that are underprovided by the free market, such as health care, education, job training. Government can provide these goods so that individuals can consume them and benefit society as a whole. So now we've got a pretty good overview of positive externalities of consumption. We've defined this market failure as a situation in which the consumption of a good creates benefits for not just the consumer him or herself, but for society as a whole. Because the benefits of these goods are not purely private, rather they are social, these goods tend to be under provided by the free market. Here we go.